Good evening. Gumba Malgan Gumba Nani Gendu, Yurigiri State Library of Queensland Gu, which is good evening. It's good to see you and welcome friends to the State Library of Queensland, which is in Baragum, the language of the community that I grew up on the Darling Downs. Um, good evening, everyone, and it's fantastic to see you here this evening. I'm Vicki McDonald, and it's my great privilege to be the State Librarian and CEO here at the State Library of Queensland. And on behalf of my colleagues, I welcome you this evening to our final Portrait of an Artist event for this year. But let me begin by acknowledging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their continuing connection to land and as custodians of stories for millennia. We are inspired by this tradition in our work to share and preserve Queensland's memory for future generations. I'd also like to extend a very warm welcome to William Yang, our um, guest artist this evening, and Rosie Hayes, uh, Associate Curator at the Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art, and also to James Surus and Marika Surus, long-term and generous supporters of State Library. Thank you for joining us this evening, and I think this will be our biggest crowd for the year, so it's fantastic to see so many people this evening. And it's wonderful to end this year's Portrait of an Artist series with William Yang, a much-loved photographer, performer and storyteller. With a career spanning five decades, William's trailblazing photographic work intersects the boundaries between social documentary and art. Born and raised in Mareeba in far north Queensland, William studied architecture in Brisbane and moved to Sydney in the late 1960s to pursue an artistic life. From the beginning, it was clear that William was going to push boundaries from the people he captured in his photographs to his powerful spoken word monologues. William has won numerous awards and his work has been exhibited across Australia and the world. The National Gallery of Australia, the National Portrait Gallery and several state libraries and state galleries all hold his work. And here at the State Library of Queensland, we are proud to have William's artist interview among the 32 that we hold in our James C. Surus collection of artist interviews. As a memory institution, we are committed to preserving and making accessible the life stories of such remarkable artists for future generations. We also understand the importance of telling the stories of diverse communities, people who've had their achievements, perspectives and voices silenced in the past. Honouring these stories and providing truthful, respectful accounts is a key imperative for a cultural institution like the State Library. Tonight, we are also fortunate to have Rosie Hayes with us. Rosie is an Associate Curator at the Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art. And in 2021, Rosie curated William's work in a major survey exhibition, Seeing and Being Seen, held um, by Quagoma. And we also have a filmmaker here this evening filming this event as part of a documentary being made focusing on William and his life. It's quite exciting for a state library to be included in the story of your life, William. And uh, I also note that William has his camera with him as well, so he's recording us throughout the evening as well. Um, I encourage everyone to participate in the conversation tonight by sending your questions via Slido for the question and answer session that will be at the end of tonight's talk. And you can see the, uh, the QR code on the screen there. The details will pop up throughout, on the screen throughout tonight's conversation as well. And finally, I'd like to thank James Surus and his sister Marika, who are great supporters of State Library through the Queensland Library Foundation. Their generosity is helping us to build a definitive documentary record of Queensland artists and one that future generations of researchers and enthusiasts will treasure. The James C. Surus Collection of Artists Interviews is an extraordinary gift, an understanding of the myriad and diverse ways that artists work, both for present, futures, for present viewers and into the future. Opening next year, the artists from the Collection of Artists Interviews will feature in our major exhibition, Meet the Artists. So I do encourage you to come back to enjoy that exhibition. But if you get a chance, I also encourage you to see our current exhibition, Queensland to a T, which offers a very different artistic experience through the, disp the display of our vibrant collection of souvenir tea towels. So I, I did notice some of you did take the opportunity this evening. So, but for now, please join me in watching William's digital story before we welcome both William and Rosie to the stage. Thank you.
So I wanted to start at the beginnings of how you became a photographer and you actually started your professional career as an architect, um, but you quite quickly transitioned to photography and I was really interested you kind of started with people and I was interested to know what drew you to photography and, and why people particularly? Um, well, when I was an undergraduate, I got a camera, Pentax camera, and I took architectural shots. And I also sh uh, took photographs of people. And I liked the people more than the architecture. And so I dropped out of architecture and um, I'd been interested in theatre, and so I tried my hand at playwriting, but I found I couldn't pay the rent. This was in Sydney. And so I started doing um, headshots for actors, and that's how I began. But pretty soon, I started to photograph events, whether they be social events or parties, and I felt that's when I found my stride at parties because um, I used to go to parties. I like going to parties. And um, so I started to become a social photographer mm -hmm. and that led me into photographing events and also I knew Kate Fitzpatrick from acting circles, mm -hmm. theatre circles. And so I was able to uh, brush with famous people. Eventually I realised that my own set of people who, who w maybe weren't that glamorous in some ways were, were the people I enjoyed photographing the most mm -hmm. because I knew them. Mm -hmm. And I, I felt I identified with uh, being part of their movement. Mm. And eventually, in the late 80s, I had a collection of um, transparencies, um, colour films, and it was quite hard to get prints of them. Mm -hmm. And so I started projecting my transparency mm -hmm. collection just as a way of showing them. It was cheaper mm -hmm. than uh, prints. Mm -hmm. Very soon, or, or it took me about seven years actually to work up enough photo essays or short stories where I could perform a show of image projection, music and me talking in a small theatre. Mm. And that was 1989 where I did The Face of Buddha in the downstairs Belvoir Street Theatre. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Although I lost money, it was a big success, the show. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone liked the format, mm -hmm. and so I decided that I'd continue with, with this. And so that was the beginning of the storytelling, monologue with slide projection, whatever you'd like to call it. Mm -hmm. And so when I would also have exhibitions of the same s images, I thought, well, this image has got a story. And mm. so I immediately um, just wrote the story on the photograph. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of uh, my writing on the image, and which I still do today. Mm -hmm. And it's very much become your signature style. Yes, absolutely. Style. Yeah. I wanted to go back just to the, um, your first exhibition, Sydney Files, it was held at the Australian Centre for Photography in 1977 and it was a collection of portraits of the Sydney social scene. And I'd really love if you could talk a little bit about that. So Sydney Files uh, was, it was really my social set mm -hmm. that was in, it was in the, the thing and they included sort of famous people like Brett White, Lee Barton, Sharp, Mm -hmm. Kate Fitzpatrick, Jenny Key and Linda Jackson. And then there were my friends, people I'd met mm -hmm. at various parties usually. Mm -hmm. And also there was the gay community, which was emerging in the 70s, which was the period of gay liberation. Taking the photographs themselves was quite tricky mm -hmm. because a lot of people still didn't want to be 
uh, identified as gay and so that there was a lot of fear within mm -hmm. that community of being outed. Mm -hmm. um, but there are also people who are from the gay community, community who are saying our um, community has been invisible for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Take my photo, here I am, and publish it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was probably part of its excitement. Mm -hmm. It was like the, the Australian gay community shown on the walls of the gallery, mm -hmm. and some of it wasn't pretty, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but it was kind of defiant. Yeah. And so, and also um, found out with this exhibition that people loved looking at photographs of themselves. When the, at the exhibition opening, sort of people would stand beside their portraits. <laughs> mm. But it was about people. And so people want their lives to be told and it's a, uh, it's a validation really. Mm. Even if it's just as simple as I was here or I was part of that or this is my life or I went here and now it's be been recorded. And I, I think that's a very strong kind of identification, a cultural identification really, and a validation of a life. Mm. The, I think the strength of my collection is that you can engage with it in, in, in a way. And I think it's that connection, right? You know, that sort of human connection is such a big part of your work. Yes, mm. that I'm telling you my story. Mm. That, that, that's really, I think, the thread mm. that runs through, even to the landscape, it's yeah. still my story. Yeah. And thank you so much, William, for joining me in this discussion today. And um, we hope it lives on in the State Library collection, the James Soros collection for many years to come. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Rosie. Thank you. <laughs> we Thank now you, get to do that in person now. Um, at some point, I, I wanted to start with, in the video we were hearing about your connection with the LGBTQI community. Um, you do, documented, documented a really rich history of the Australian queer community. And, you know, you, you spoke about the importance of seeing yourself uh, and your story represented. And something that I'm interested in is that you often explore some of those histories through your own story, uh, obviously your own friendships, but also your exploration of your own sexual identity. Uh, and some of these stories call for you to be vulnerable. So self-portraiture is a big part of your work. And I wondered how you approached your vulnerability when you're taking your own self-portrait um, and how you kind of incorporated that into your work? Uh, perhaps a good way to start off with this is you've seen that I do performances and <clears throat> when you tell a story, you've kind of got to give, you've got to be vulnerable to make people like you or want to listen to you. And so I realised, I, I didn't know this, but um, I realised this after I'd been performing for a while. And um, how I express it is to tell a story, you have to bleed a little. You can't, because I'd come from this tradition of being a photographer behind the camera. And um, there was a kind of sense um, then that the photography, the photography, the photographer was um, impartial. He wasn't judgmental and he, he was just presenting the facts or whatever. But I quickly realised that really I didn't want to be that or it's better if I participated 
in the story and I was part of the story and allowed other people to engage with it. So um, that's how I came to be vulnerable, I guess. And I don't know, I don't, I'm not always vulnerable, but um, I, I think that I do storytelling workshops and I do um, try to persuade my storytellers to bleed a little. <laughs> Hard to put it on in in a photograph, but that human connection is obviously something that is so relatable and so much part of your work. Um, I wanted to start at the beginning. <clears throat> Vicky touched on the idea that the fact that you uh, were born in Maribra and you grew up in far north Queensland. Um, and on your family's tobacco farm. And your grandparents emigrated from China and both your parents were born in Australia. So this is kind of 1950s rural Australia, um, far north Queensland. I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about that experience and how formative it, it was um, and what it was like growing up in rural Queensland and how that informed your work later. Um, well, I grew up in Dimbula and uh, I didn't, I, I was just a, uh, a person really as a child. But there's one story that I tell uh, which has become like my incantation. Uh, the um, critic John MacDonald said, because I've told it so many times, and I'll tell it again for you, because it's an important story. When I was about six years old, one of the kids at school called me Ching Chong Chinaman, born in a jar, christened in a teapot, ha, ha, ha. I had no idea what he was talking about but I knew from his expression he was being horrible to me. So I went home to my mother and I said to her, Mom, I'm not Chinese, am I? And my mother looked at me very sternly and she said, yes, you are. Her tone was hard and it shocked me. And I knew in that moment that being Chinese was like some terrible curse and I could not rely on my mother for help. Or my brother, who was four years older than me, very much more experienced in the world, he chimed in, and you'd better get used to it. <laughs> and so I grew up without realising that I was Chinese. And I identified with being Australian. Um, there were lots of uh, what, what you call new Australians in that area, Mariva Dimbula, mainly uh, Europeans, and um, they were called new Australians. And um, I, I didn't quite identify with them because I spoke English. That's the only language I, I, um, I know. Uh, I, don't, I don't speak Chinese. And so I, I, I kind of felt as if I wasn't a new Australian. I was like an established Australian because I spoke English. And looking back now, um, I'm, I identify more with being Australian than being European or Chinese. And language has got a bit to do with it. My father was a Hakka, and he spoke Hakka, and my mother spoke, was a Siyap, and she spoke Cantonese, so English was their common language. Uh, but my mother could have taught us Cantonese, as it was usually left up to her to do that sort of thing, but she never did. She wanted us she thought being Chinese was a complete liability. 
and she wanted us to be more Australian than the Australians. So I've always grown up thinking that I was identifying with being Australian and it's just when I looked in the mirror that there was a disconjunction. And I wondered <clears throat> if you might touch on a little bit of some of your family history and perhaps one of the reasons why your mother felt that uh, your Chinese identity was a complete liability and something that is really important to your work is representing past injustices in Australia of um, racial injustice, but also bringing stories to light that haven't always been allowed to be spoken. And I wondered if you might talk about your really powerful series, which is called My Uncle's Murder. Yes, I, when I was in my mid-30s, I came to terms with being Chinese. I, I took up Taoism, which is a Chinese philosophy, and I researched my family history, and I embraced my Chinese heritage. And I went up to North Queensland, and I talked to my relatives about an event that occurred in 1922, where my uncle, William Fang Yuan, was murdered. He was quite well-to-do. He had cane farms in his shop. And on one of his cane farms, he employed a white Russian to be his manager. And on this particular day, they had an argument, and the manager, whose name was Peter Danilshenko, shot him in cold blood. Now, the scandal of the event was that there was a trial and Peter Danilshenko was acquitted of first degree murder. And I always say that killing a Chinaman was not considered a serious crime. So, when I researched that um, story, I found in the Innisfail Courthouse documents from the trial, and my mother had given evidence at that trial, and she had, she was 16 at the time, and she, she gave evidence of Fa William Fang Yuen, um, and she'd never ever told me about this. And I felt that that is why she wanted us to be more Australian than the Australians. She didn't want us to identify as being Chinese. She didn't want us to speak the language because that would have made us different and a target. And suddenly I understood um, how my ethnicity had been suppressed and why it had been suppressed and that it was important now, that now me in the present should tell this story and kind of promote a diverse culture which embraces all races. Mm. Mm. And you document quite a, as as well, really powerful stories and also the history of Chinese within Australia. But one of the things as well is you document your journey to embracing your Chinese heritage. Was that something that you felt was really important to make work about? Or was it just, it was just something that came out because it was what was so present for you when you were kind of reclaiming and rethinking that at the time? Um, I, I went up, I travelled up to North Queensland to research that story and I made it into a, a story called Sadness. And there were two strands for the um, Sadness story. One was the story of my uncle's murder and it was like a potted history of my Chinese-Australian family. And the other part of the story was the gay community in Sydney that was in the middle of the AIDS pandemic where, where people were dying. And 
I never, I didn't really think about that when, when I was doing it. Uh, I didn't really think too much about it. But sadness was very successful for me. And on t for two reasons, I think that it was one of the first Chinese stories that was told by a Chinese. Um, and also, because of the AIDS pan pandemic, it was very relevant to the times. And so if you can find a story that people can reson that can resonate with people, then um, you're onto a good thing, I think. And so sadness traveled all, all around Australia and the world, and it started me off on a, a international touring circuit where when I did my other performance pieces, they toured on this circuit to other places in the world. And so um, they, they kind of climbed up on the back of sadness, I think. Now, mm. what, what else were you asking me? Well, I, essentially that, but also the reclaiming. I guess that story of you reclaiming your heritage and um, thinking about um, what, you, what kind of an Australian you were and how you felt comfortable with that, which I think you've pretty much answered. So we can, <laughs> unless you want to say but more. Actually, I'll go back a bit because that comment is more pertinent to the gay community mm. where people felt... I started photographing in the gay community um, and people were a bit scared of being... Well, some people, especially if you were well-known or famous, were a bit scared of being photographed and often they'd say, oh, don't publish this. This was in the 70s. Um, but um, at the same time, there were people who um, would be in... Well, you saw, you saw a bit of it on, on the film. People who were kind of flaunting themselves and saying, publish me. Um, this is this is what I am, and so um, I think the feeling within the gay community was that our community has been invisible for thousands of years. These stories may not be pretty, but we want our stories told. So. I've lost my thought. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. I can pour you a drink of water. <laughs> so, oh yes, right. So often I take photographs of gay people, and they'd say to me, um, "Please, please, can we, can we have this photograph? Um, we we haven't got a photograph of us." and we're not on the mantelpiece of um, the family photographs in my mother's place, and pl please can we have a photograph? And I think it's very, I, I said this in the clip actually, it's very important for people to feel that they're visible and that they're acknowledged and that they're part of a society. And that's probably been part of my success is just representing people because um, um, they feel validated. Mm. Mm. And, and part of that, I think, is also a bit of a refutation of shame as well. You know, many of these um, communities that have that there's been a lot of shame and stigma attached to representations of those communities and then remaking um, the way that they're seen in the public eye as well was important, I felt. That, that's right. Well, I, I felt ashamed of being um, Chinese and I guess of being gay. Um, but first of all, I came out as being gay and there was the movement in the 70s called gay liberation. And that was what liberation was, throwing off the society's 
attitudes and shackles where um, you more or less embraced who you were. And I suppose the manifestation of that was the Mardi Gras where people would march down the streets. And a lot of people would say, oh, you're flaunting yourself. Why are you, why are you parading like this? And I think that people who've been repressed, say sexually suppressed, they, they, they want to they want to throw it off and make a big statement and be liberated and be in your face. And so I can understand totally why the Mardi Gras was like it was. It, it, it was flaunting itself, being provocative. And I think that when people come out of suppression, there is that tendency to do those kinds of things. Like, um, I've, I've seen it when people come out, um, whether they're 30 or 40 or 50, they want, to, they want to be on a float in the Mardi Gras. They want to wear skimpy shorts. <laughs> they, they want to be a slut. So th that's, just a th that's just a thing that happens. That's human nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I suppose with race, it's a bit more, um, it's a bit more subtle. Uh, but people want to be, the, the, people want to be represented, to be shown on, on the screen. And um, I, I was just reading um, in the movies when um, the film Casablanca, there was the black um, pianist that, that, that uh, just had a brief cameo in the film. And when they, they showed that film in black communities, this is in the 50s in America, the, the black community would demand that they stop the film and replay the scene. So, so, so there's that people want to be represented. Mm. Mm. And have that connection and feel seen. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so I wanted to shift into a different register of something else that I think is really integral to your career, um, but often people overshadow it, is actually your landscape works. Um, and so your landscape photography has actually been throughout your whole career and often, as with the photographs of people, you're often scribing a story on the landscape. And I wondered if you would talk a little about your relationship to nature, actually, and how the natural world and, and your work interrelate. I said earlier that I became Taoist, which, which is a philosophy, but is very um, tied to nature. And I guess, well, I've always photographed nature and lots of people photograph nature. It's really a very popular subject. But I guess I was, when I really got into nature, I, I found that nature was beautiful. And I guess I was always searching for a beautiful image. And I found it easier to find a beautiful image in nature than perhaps in human people. And so it's also a chance to talk about spirituality, which um, is kind of difficult to talk about in um, the society in which we live. Uh, it's usually tied to religion, um, but I always feel when I'm in nature that I'm refreshed in a, in a spiritual way and that's why I like being in the bush. Um, 
I'd like to be there more, but it's a way of maybe uh, just tapping into a, a universal energy that uh, runs in nature. And if you can tap into it, then you will, you can find it healing and refreshing. I've said that word's refreshing three times, but that's <laughs> probably the, the, the way I feel about it. Mm, mm, I completely agree. And do you think that you, do you think that your relationship to the natural world has changed over time? And do you think that photographing changes that in any way? Or is it just a natural expression of how you feel in the moment? Um, it probably hasn't changed, but I like being in nature and being in different places. And the wonderful thing about my nature, no matter where you go, it's so different. And um, it, it's kind of endlessly boundless. And so you can go anywhere in nature and somehow tap into it. Mm -hmm. And so m the thing that I haven't done, and, and I watch documentaries and I feel, um, shouldn't I be pointing out to people the dangers of climate change? But I feel that people know that now and that really, if I just presented something that was, showed nature's beauty, then that could be more lasting. Mm. Mm. Again, and building that connection, absolutely. Um, so, I wondered if we could steer it back to how, your work, how you work now and your present process, I wondered what your approach to making work currently is. The other day you said to me, oh, I don't really make work anymore. But I see you make taking images, photographs all the time. So I'd love to hear how you, your approach to your work now. I still take photographs, but I don't take as many photographs. And I feel that uh, my work has been a reflection of my life in that when I was younger, I had more energy and I could run around and um, take photographs, um, stay up all night, go to dance parties, all of that kind of thing. But then you become older, you become more mature and maybe you change your view of what you photograph. Um, and then I'm in the latter stages of my life. I don't have that much energy. I don't take that many photographs, but what I'm really concentrating on now is my archive and how to preserve that archive and how to make that archive accessible to people when I'm dead. So I've been spending quite a lot of time just this past year doing that. I've got someone helping me. And the, the big thing that I need to do is to digitize my negatives because no one can read a black and white negative and more than three quarters of my collection uh, is in black and white negatives. And so I'm um, getting people to help me digitize my collection so that the images can talk to other systems. And that's quite a big uh, task, but I can see that I should put more energy into digitizing the negatives. And the people at the library said to me, oh, that's unusual because in, in most of our collections, the people are, are already dead when we get the, <laughs> get the <laughs> negatives. And so it's made me more conscious and I, I'm going through it and s s saying in more detail what the, what the event was. This was 
so-and-so's party and um, um, it, it was attended by these people who were um, artists or something. And this was, a, for example, the party that Brett Whiteley had when he moved into his studio at Raper Street. He had a, he had a big party that night. And um, now I, I'm seeing that that's an important event that I went to. Um, and the, 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 the photographs are valuable in a um, documentary historical concept, uh, context. Mm. So I'm just trying to pull it all together and um, I'm going through and I'm annotating my, um, you know, instead of just having Johnny's party or something <laughs> as a title, it's Johnny Lewis who was a photographic colleague of mine and this is when he had his exhibition about um, whatever, you know. Mm. Mm. And, and it's... The, it's so interesting, right, isn't it, that as a photograph or a document ages, it carries more weight and it carries more significance and, and we look back at Brett Whiteley's seminal party and, and realise, you know, the influence it had. Yes. Mm. Mm. So we've actually reached the time for audience questions. Um, and so I'm going to see a collection of audience questions, um, if we could throw to those. I can't see them on screen yet, but while we're waiting for audience questions, um, I thought I would just ask a bit of a fun uh, question about influences. So I think often when artists start out their career, they often get asked about their artistic influences. Um, but as you progress, less so. And so I wondered if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about who were your influences, whether that's within the visual art community or otherwise uh, starting out, whether they've changed and who is um, sparking your interest now. Um, I've always said that the American photographer Diane Arbus is, has always been my favourite photographer and I probably saw, first saw her photographs in the 60s or the 70s and um, she, they kind of shocked me really uh, and they gave me uh, an emotion that only a photograph could give me. It's a kind of sense of reality and it's a sense of a photograph that uh, a painting can't do. And so I realised that photography was its own medium. Not, not that I wanted to take photographs like Diane Arbus, but I could see that... I could understand that photography was a medium. And the other person who influenced me hu hugely was another American, and his name was Spaulding Gray. And he was a monologuist. And I first saw him um, at the Belvoir Street Theatre when he did a piece called Swimming to Cambodia. And he was very discursive. And um, he'd talk about his sex life and... Um, and I, I was just amazed how engaged I felt with him just talking about his life and his girlfriend or something. And again, I, I didn't realise it at the time, but it, it's like he was bleeding all over the stage, really, <laughs> is what, what drew me in. And so he was a big influence. And his, his, that work, Swimming to Cambodia, which is his, his great work, and he's never done anything as good as that since. But he went over to make a film in Cambodia, um, 
might have been the, the Killing Fields, and he had a bit part in the film, but he just had a story of travelling over to Cambodia, being in the film, and it was set against the background of the war and also against the background of Southeast Asia. And I, f I found that like a masterpiece. Mm. Mm. Uh, and this, those works stay with us, right, that, that really change how we feel about the world. Is there somebody now, do you still kind of feel like you have artistic influences now that are still influencing your work? Or is it more that that, that was a formative part early in your career? No, I can't think of anyone who I've seen uh, recently who's had the same impact on mm. me. Um, I do like... See, I, I belong to... My basis is um, documentary photography, which is a bit out of fashion at the moment. Um, but um, I do see documentary films Documentary photographs, I think, are neg neglected in general, that um, people don't take them seriously, or they're not fashionable, really, is what it is. Mm. They're taken seriously, but they're not fashionable. And they're not always seen as, like, an art form that yes. should be in the gallery. And that was something that I think was a really, you, a really important part of the process of, of showing your work in the gallery as well, to talk about that journalistic, almost, aspect of your work. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and, but um, the irony is that, that documentary films are held in high regard and I really can't see the difference. Um, but I, I saw um, a, a documentary film on Netflix, let's say, called Wild Wild Country, um, which was about the Ananda Marga movement and about spiritualism and gu gurus in India in the 60s, which is when I was, when, when I became conscious of all of that. And I, I found that absolutely, uh, it all went bad, by the way, is the story. <laughs> <laughs> but I was totally drawn into that and th thought that really, why don't people, like documentary photography, because mm. it was just more more engaging than than a lot of fiction that I see. Yeah, or film. yeah, really interesting, and it may well cycle around. Questions. Beautiful, thank you. Okay, uh, we'll we'll have a few more a bit, a little bit more time for some audience questions. So one of the questions is, how did it feel to see all your work together? at the Quag exhibition. I mean, obviously you've had solo shows in the past, but this was a very big survey looking back at your whole career. Um, were there any surprises unearthed? Uh, I was thrilled with the um, um, retrospective or s survey um, that was at Quag last year. Um, it was a really a complete um, look at my work, it all fitted together. And when I say work, I can equate that with my life, because I felt that my life was on display. It was like my autobiography. And so I was thrilled about that. And uh, Rosie curated it, and I liked her cu curation. Um, and I felt that the thing held together and um, there, were, there were several sections of it which I hadn't thought of before. There was a section called Chinese Identity, um, which um, kind of made sense to me. I hadn't actually thought of them, of the, that selection of photographs all in the one section before, and I, I'd split it up more. But... Um, no, I, I, was, I was thrilled with that exhibition and also the catalogue. And um, and it, it, made, it made me... Re it gave me a new look at my life story, and, uh, which, which I hadn't really 
Well, I guess that's what storytelling is. It's when you put the elements of your story into something coherent, and it had never been, my exhibitions had never been on that scale before, and then I could see it as, a, it was more or less like William Young, a life, and that's really what I, what I wanted it to be. Mm. Mm. Fantastic. Um, Someone was wondering if you could talk about your experiences of Mardi Gras and your friendship with David McDermott and Peter Tully. I first met Peter Tully and David McDermott in Sydney in the 70s. They were from Melbourne. They were friends with Linda Jackson and later Jenny Key. Um, they were self-identified artists. Um, and David was gay, and his work was specifically gay. And I'd never s quite thought of what a, what, a, what a gay artist was or what the subjects could be. And uh, so David was a bit of an eye-opener for me, and, uh, and I... I liked his work right from the start. Big, big influence on me um, because he helped me articulate what, what was a gay sensibility, I guess. Peter wasn't gay in that sense of the word, but he was funky and he used to make jewellery and he was a witty person and he was funny. He'd make costumes uh, and... They were just, and he started off in 1981 or 1982. He got a grant from the um, craft or community section of the Australia Council, a grant of $6,000, to start the Mardi Gras workshop and be the artistic director of the Mardi Gras. And so his influence into the Mardi Gras has been enormous. And almost over the, those first few years, it became the prototype of the modern Mardi Gras. So that's a huge influence. And so they were friends of mine and um, they had their own... Um, they went over to the USA and they came back and in the 90s, both of them had AIDS. And so that was rather chilling. And David, um, then in his last years, all of his work is about AIDS. And so he pulled out all stops. And right up until the time he died, um, he, he did works about AIDS, uh, which are incredible. For example, even when he was so weak that he couldn't, the only thing that he could do is um, make works on the computer, uh, which he called rainbow aphorisms. And one of the, they, they were just like sayings um, against a rainbow background. For example, one of them was, lifetimes are not what they used to be. Uh, and and they're, they're, they're very poignant and sharp and witty. And so, um, yes. But, but David himself was quite a prickly character. And so, um, yeah, he... He, he he was a bit prickly, so um, you, you had to watch out for him. Watch out <laughs> for him, and uh, he kind of criticised Peter at the end that Peter didn't do enough works about AIDS, for example. But but they were very good friends, and David had an exhibition down in Melbourne called "Don't Leave Me This Way," which was like a retrospective of his of his work, and it was quite magnificent, really to see all his work in, 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 in the, the same space. 
Peter's work, um, Peter's hasn't had that same um, recognition. Um, oh, maybe I shouldn't go go to why he hasn't had that same recognition, but it would be great if Peter had a similar retrospective. But um, I, I was all, I was just thrilled for David when I saw that exhibition at the um, National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne. And I, I was similarly thrilled when I saw my own retrospective <laughs> here at the um, Quagoma. So um, it is very satisfying to see your work in a complete form and, and, and to feel that um, you, you've made your statement. Mm. Mm. We'll end on a, a quite a light note. Okay. This is the, our last question, but people will really want to know, who was your favourite celebrity to photograph and why? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Out of the thousands. Um, I'm trying to think of this, but maybe I'll talk about Jabane Greer. <laughs> Not that she's my favourite person, but she's a challenge <laughs> because she's larger than life and um, uh, she's totally overwhelming as a human. And so... I'm a kind of yielding person, so I always tremble whenever I, I have to <laughs> photograph Jermaine Greer. And she won't take direction, absolutely won't take direction. Um, so, um, yeah, I, 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 she's such a strong person that I just don't think she wants to submit to the camera. I won't take it personally. But <laughs> It's the camera that she doesn't like, <laughs> and so and so she's always uh, she, she's always tough, and I'm always, uh, for example, um, Ma Margaret Fink is a very good friend of mine. Jermaine was staying with her, and Margaret was uh, having a lunch for her, and so and I knew that Margaret wanted me to take photographs of Jermaine, and so I showed up and. Um, I said, um, oh, I thought I'd be polite, actually, and say to J Jermaine, well, Jermaine, um, do you mind if I take your photo? And um, she, she, she looked at me, she said, where's your camera? <laughs> and I said, well, it's in my bag. <laughs> she said, that's where it should stay. <laughs> And so I look stricken, and so she, uh, so she said, don't look at me that way. And I said, but Margaret really wants me to t take photographs of you. And she said, if you must. <laughs> and so, that, so that, that's memorable. It's uh, not my favourite experience, but <laughs> memorable. Certainly, definitely, definitely. I think we've come to the end of our time and I think, I believe that there's time, the time has come for the lucky door prize. Oh. <laughs> We're not in the running, unfortunately. Yeah, of course. Um, I'll get, I've got a few key messages. I've learned, I did this the wrong way round once where I did the raffle and then nobody paid attention afterwards. <laughs> so I've, I've have your attention. You are all potential winners at this stage. Um, I just want to um, just thank really Rosie and William for the fantastic conversation. And can we just get a round of applause for the... <laughs> I'd also like to just give a plug for a current exhibition and an upcoming exhibition. Um, the uh, Craig Goma exhibition, Courage and Beauty, which features uh, uh, artworks from James's collection, is uh, currently on, uh, on display at Craig Goma. Um, and we have an another exhibition which Vicky mentioned 
um, at State Library in where the tea towels are now will be the space that the exhibition will be installed in February next year called Meet the Artists, which will be a feature of all of the artists who feature within um, the James C. Sirius collection. Um, so keep, keep your ears to the ground with that. There will be promotion and that sort of thing uh, ramping up shortly. Um, there will also be, this is the last portrait of, of an artist uh, for the year. Um, so thank you for everybody who's taken part in three events um, over this year. We'll be returning in March next year to run um, in alignment with the Meet the Artist exhibition. So um, the very exciting artist in works to be, to be, to be announced. Um, but in March next year, we'll be doing, uh, doing that event. Um, we'll also, uh, this is a very technical sort of, I've, I've got a laundry list of things. Um, also, you'll be getting a survey, and we've been getting some response to our surveys of the events, but um, you'll be getting an email in the coming days. Uh, if you've got any feedback about um, tonight or the series over the, over the year, please get back to us and um, complete that survey. It really does help us format and shape the um, events to, to meet you know, your needs and your, your wants and your desires. Um, I'd just like to again just thank you, um, to Marika and James for making tonight possible and I'd just like everybody to give a big, <laughs> big applause. <laughs> they make so many things possible um, and one of the things they've made possible is this lovely uh, monograph called Courage and Beauty. So uh, one lucky person will be able to take this home with them tonight. So, drum roll. And I might just get, can I get William to, to, <laughs> I, I, to I think draw. it's fitting if you, yeah, can you draw? <laughs> Thank you, why? <laughs> <laughs> okay, the winner is green. B47. <laughs> we got a winner? Hi. It's not rigged. <laughs> uh, <laughs> congratulations. Um, that ends the proceedings for tonight. Um, thank you again for your participation, your questions, your presence, your enthusiasm for this series. It really is a pleasure putting it on uh, for you. And I'd just really like to thank the participation of Rosie and William for making this tonight possible. Thank you. So, thank you. Have a good night. <laughs>